Uh, today we're going to continue our series in, um, called Signs, looking at the signs in the book of John. And uh, today we're looking at, at John chapter 9, and the story actually is the whole chapter. So I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'll mostly just tell you the story, but I'll read some verses here and there as, as we go through. Uh, the story is actually told in seven different sections. Um, the first section I'm calling a person, not a topic. And we begin with verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, we're never given the name of this man. All we know is he's simply a, a man who was blind. And he was sitting by the road, most likely had his coat spread out so that as people came by, they could drop money on it because this was the only way he had of supporting himself and taking care of himself. And Jesus and the disciples walked by where he was sitting. And throughout this story, there is sort of a double meaning going on throughout the whole story about the words see and the words blind. Because you see, Jesus saw this man. And because he saw him, he wanted to do something for him. Now the disciples, they noticed him, but they didn't really see him. And, and so uh, when, when they walked by, you know, Jesus saw him and saw he had a need. And so Jesus wanted to do something to meet that need. So down in verse 3, um, what happens is um, the, the disciples, when they see him or when they notice him, they want to know why he's blind. They don't just see a person with a need. They, they notice somebody that they want to know why he's blind. Was it his fault or was it his parents' fault? Uh, who had committed a sin? Uh, they, they saw a topic for discussion. They didn't see a man sitting there who had a need. Uh, so then this is what happens in verse 3. Jesus says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus kind of shot a hole in their um, theology. And he said, we don't have time to discuss theology conspiracies. Um, you can save that for Facebook. Um, but we're going to do something to help this person that they really didn't seem to see. But Jesus saw him. And because Jesus saw him, Jesus reached out to him. It says that Jesus spit on the ground, not for the same reason a lot of people spit on the ground, but Jesus spit on the ground, and they took the clay and the spit, and he made this little mud pack out of it, and he put it on his eyes, and he told him to go and wash his eyes. And when the man did that, for the first time in his life, he could see. And he was excited. And so he ran home to tell everybody. <clears throat> and so section two is gossip over the fence. And uh, by the way, this section is the longest section in the entire Gospel of John uh, in which Jesus um, is not present. This is just telling us about what was going on with the other folks. So when this man who was blind, now he can see, got home, the rumors were flying back and forth over the backyard fence and he was so excited he could see and he was telling everybody and some of the neighbors were saying, hey, isn't that the guy that used to be blind and now he can see? And some of the other neighbors were saying, well, you know, I don't think that is him. I think he just looks like him. And then interesting, he was blind, so we know he never saw his neighbors, but apparently his neighbors never saw him either because they couldn't even recognize him. And they said, we're not sure that that's him or not. So then down in verse 11, he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes and he told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and then I could see. So he, he didn't know what Jesus looked like. He'd never seen him. He just knew that this man named Jesus had made this this, this, you know, mud and put it on his eyes, and now he could see. And I think it's, it's interesting. He calls him a man. This man named Jesus did this for me. Now, I want you to watch throughout this story how his faith grows. At first, Jesus is a man. So section three is the interrogation. 
The Pharisees caught wind of this, and it just happened to have been a Sabbath in which he was healed, and so they were upset that Jesus would heal somebody on the Sabbath. They brought him in to question him, to find out what happened. And so then he, they, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he's a prophet. This is section four, just the facts, ma'am. You know, first he said, Jesus must be a man. And then he says, you know, he, he must be a prophet to be able to heal me. And I think it's fascinating. It's obvious now that this man can see. But there were people who did not want to believe that. It did not fit their tribal narrative of what they thought the world should be. And so when they are confronted with the facts, they choose not to believe it. They instead choose to believe what they want to believe. And so the, Pharise, uh, the, the neighbors say, well, you know, if, it looks like he used to be blind, but now he can see. But, you know, that really wasn't him. This is somebody else. So that's what happened. And then the Pharisees said, well, you know, it looks like he was blind and now he can see. But I'll tell you what really happened is he was just pretending to be blind all the time for sympathy. <laughs> he wasn't really blind. That's not really what happened. Yeah, it, it is amazing to me how we do this. And when we do the same thing today. When confronted with theological facts or scientific facts or political facts, we choose to believe our own little narrative instead of the truth, even when it's put before us. And so now the Pharisees call his parents in for questioning because he didn't answer the question the way they wanted him to. And so uh, down in verse 19, they say, is this your son? They ask, is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? So, so you see, their theological narrative did not allow for somebody who was born blind to be healed and now be able to see. So there had to be some other reason. And so they call his parents in, but his parents say, listen, it, this is our son. We can identify him. That This is our son. And he was born blind. And now he can see. And there are three questions the Pharisees kept asking. Was he born blind? And if he really was born blind, how is it that now he can see? And the third question is, who is the one who enabled him to see? Now, I want you to notice, they only asked the parents the first two questions, but they answered all three. They said, this is our son, he was born blind. Now he can see. And then they freely uh, you know, offered, oh, and we don't know who healed him. Well, of course they knew. <laughs> but they didn't want to get in trouble with the Pharisees. And so they answered this question they weren't even asked. It's sort of like uh, when you um, have this conversation with your child and you say, you haven't been in mom and dad's bedroom, have you? And she says, oh no. And I don't know anything about that broken lamp. <laughs> you know, sometimes guilty people just tell you more than they need to. And uh, that's sort of what they did. So down in verse 21, but how can he now, but how can he see now? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. And this is his parents. <laughs> and they say, don't ask us. He's 18. Talk to him. Nothing like getting thrown under the bus by your own parents, right? Section five is the interrogation, the sequel. Pharisees bring him back in. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. <laughs> but they were not deterred by the truth. They just kept asking the same question over and over again thinking that, you know, if you question the truth long enough and loud enough, then people will stop believing the truth. So here's a man who had been healed and he had had enough. He was tired. This was getting old to him. He had spent his entire life blind. And now he could see, and here he was sitting in this stuffy room full of stuffy people, 
He had heard their questions over and over again. He had answered them over and over again. They weren't listening to him. Uh, you know, he had been blind his whole life, his whole life, and now he's beginning to think they're deaf because every time he answers them, they act like they didn't hear it. And so he had enough. I mean, he, he had heard birds fly overhead. He was going to go outside and see them. He had smelled flowers. He was going to go outside and see what they looked like. There was a woman who used to walk by and say kind things to him as he could hear the coins drop on his, on his garment. He wanted to look her up, see what she looked like, and thank her for being so kind to him. He was tired of being there. So finally he said, why do you want to know so much about him? Do you want to be his disciples too? <laughs> he knew that would end the interview. Uh, and it did. In, in verse 33, uh, you know, they throw him out. Uh, and in verse 33, he says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So at first he was a man, then he was a prophet, and now he's, he must be from God, or he couldn't have done this. Well, that was all they needed. They threw him out, out of the synagogue. He was gone. Section six, a friend on the outside. When they threw him out, guess who looked him up? <laughs> Jesus was pursuing him, just like he always pursues us. And so Jesus heard they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He didn't recognize Jesus because he had never seen him before. Last time he saw it, but it's next, last time he was with Jesus, he was blind. But when Jesus told him who he was, he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. First, Jesus was a man. Then he must be a prophet. He must be from God. And now he believes that he is God. He is the Lord. And so he worships him. And, and finally, you know, he saw Jesus. And the point of the story is just that he was healed of physical blindness, but he could see now the truth. He could see who Jesus was. And, and here is the, the final section, blind in the worst way. Jesus said, for judgment I have come to this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. And the Pharisees who heard him say this asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So back up in verse 5, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he healed this man physically. He gave him physical sight. That's the miracle, but it's a sign. And it's a sign that points to something else. And what it points to is that how God wants to give all of us spiritual sight. He wants to give all, he wants all of us to be able to see the world the way God sees the world. And so it's more than a miracle of restoring physical sight to a man born blind. It's a sign pointing to how Jesus came to give sight to those of us who live in the darkness of our own sin and our own prejudices. And so, so this man was born blind and Jesus physically healed him. Now the Pharisees, they physically possessed sight, but they were blind because they couldn't see who Jesus was. They couldn't see the world the way God saw the world. So they're still blind. So the, the story reminds me of a quote of one of my heroes, a fellow Alabamian uh, named Helen Keller. Helen Keller was born deaf and blind. And yet she wrote this, there are none so blind as those who will not see. <laughs> Helen Keller was one of those people without physical sight who saw the world more clearly than most sighted people. Jesus, and, and this is the sign, is that Jesus came not only to forgive us of our sin, but he came to also open our eyes to help us see the world 
as God sees the world. John Newton, who wrote those famous words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You know, John Newton was in the slave trade business. And not only did God forgive him, but God opened his eyes. And he began to see things as God saw things. And so he quit his business because he could see it was wrong. Because not only did he have forgiveness, but now he had sight. The shooting in Buffalo last week reminds us of so many layers of darkness that we live in. Now, I can't speak for anyone else. I only know my own heart. But I have to tell you, I grew up in an environment that was racist. I was taught white supremacy. And I walked in that darkness. And because my skin was white, I didn't even know I was in the darkness. But when God forgave me of my sin, God opened my eyes and I began to see the world differently than I had seen it before. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit and for the writings of Holy Scripture and Harper Lee and James Baldwin and James Cone who shined light into my darkness so that I could see something I couldn't see before. Now, racism isn't the only darkness we live in. There are other ways we live in darkness. And both Isaiah and Matthew encourage us that even though we live in darkness, we have seen a great light. And even though we live in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. <laughs> we no longer live in darkness because Jesus came to give us sight, to see the world as God sees the world. Now, I don't have 2020 spiritual vision yet, but I see the world differently than I used to see the world. And God is helping me to see the world as God sees the world. God helps all of us to see the world as God sees the world. And when we start to see then we stop just seeing people as male and female and black and white and rich and poor and Republican and Democrat and expendable and not expendable and essential and not essential and straight and gay. And we start to look at people and see in them the image of God. And we see people as the children of God who deserve to be treated as sisters and brothers, I have it on good word. This darkness will one day end. But until that day, we can still choose to walk in the light. The good news is Jesus is the light of the world. And we can choose to leave the darkness and walk in the light. Amen.